Hi guys, here we are. This is part two of unit 16, acids and bases. So we've talked about the, um, just kind of the general characteristics in some um, cases for the acids and bases. We also talked about the definitions and conjugates. So we're moving on today to strong and weak, and then a couple of special reactions that um, acids and bases go through. So first of all, you guys have probably heard, um, uh, even like in the last unit, like I would say, a strong acid reacts with this, or a weak base. And that strong and weak, very often we we think it is talking about concentration, but in in the term of our in the case of acids and bases it's not it's actually talking about electrolytes and so we've done this before we've talked about um, uh, electrolytes versus non electrolytes and so acids are and bases are electrolytes and they can be strong or weak and strong is just the same definition as we talked about before they break apart 100 percent and so when you put those into water they separate into their positive and their negative ion every single molecule that is in there and so that hcl that i have right there in um underneath that first little term it is a strong acid because when you put it into water you get a bunch of h's and a bunch of cl's there are no more hcl's left um some other examples nitric acid, sulfuric acid, that's perchloric acid, that last one there. And so they are going to ionize completely. Now you do have weak acids. And again, this is not dilute. This means that they ionize slightly or to a certain percentage. So this is acetic acid, which is vinegar, basically. When you put vinegar into water, some H's break apart, some of the acetates, the C2H3O2 break apart, but you also have a very large proportion of the acid that remains uh, together. And so that's the slight part. Then um, an example, the, another example I have on there is carbonic acid. So that's strong versus weak in terms of definitions. And, um, Determining that is actually, there's a method to it, which is nice. You don't have just to memorize things. And so we have two forms of acids, which we talked about when we did the naming. We have binary acids or ternary acids. Binary acids are strong if they contain H with anything in group seven except fluorine. So these are the halogens any halogen with hydrogen except fluorine except for the for the top um the top row is going to be strong so um hcl hbr hi all those guys all of those are going to be strong now ternary is a little bit different because you actually get to do a little math you get to do math yay, yay. so what you would do is take the difference of the subscript number on the O and the first H. Some of these are gonna have multiple H's, so that's why we clarify with the first H. If the difference is two or more, it's a strong acid. So I've got nitric acid is my first example there. And so the three is the three on the O. The one is that understood one that's right there with the H. Three minus one is two. So I know that this is a strong acid then the next one sulfuric acid i've got four minus two equals two so there's another strong acid carbonic acid and i know some of these i just told you the answers but um for carbonic acid i have three minus two the three from the o and the two from the h that is one and so that is weak and then that last one, this is where that the first H becomes important. So you would still take the two on the O and then that one is that first H. So it is two minus one, which is one, and that is weak. So you totally ignore the H's in the middle if there are any there. All right, so pretty easy. Um, you just have to kind of remember the process. 
Now, with bases, the definitions are the same. It is a strong base if it ionizes 100%. And the way to tell this, a base is strong, <coughs> excuse me, if it contains a group one or a group two metal. So anything from the first two columns. And so if they are with OH, so in this, our example case, we have NaOH. Na is in the first column, so that is going to be strong. Um, so anything else in, in those two columns, Li, K, Ca, Mg, all those guys, if they are with an OH, then they are considered a strong base. Weak base, um, again, ionizes only slightly, so you will have um, a large proportion of the base staying together. But a base is weak if it contains a transition metal, so anything in the middle. If it is NH4, this is one, I know it kind of stinks, this is one you just have to memorize. Um, or any of our special three that are in that little diagonal that you guys have on your periodic tables those are considered weak okay so you have to kind of follow those rules and i have never come up with a really good way to write that on the periodic table other than just to list it and so um if you want to do that do it um otherwise remember of course you'll have your notes on tests and stuff okay now the two reactions hydrolysis hydrolysis is when you add salt any salt a chemical salt remember is um an a metal and a non-metal or an anion and a cation, anything from the left side of the periodic table and anything from the right side, those are salts. If you add those to water, they will produce an acid and a base. And then not only do they produce an acid or a base, they will produce a solution. And you can determine if that solution is neutral, acidic, or basic based on the stuff that we were just talking about. Okay, so these are double replacement reactions. And so, <clears throat> pardon me, you will have in this first reaction, the Na trading places with that first H. So HOH, remember, is water. And it will make your life a lot easier in these reactions, at least if you write water HOH, because then it clearly shows what is what switch in places and what isn't. So you end up over there with HCl and NaOH. Now, depending on the strength of those two things, you can either have one of these three, that neutral, acidic, or basic. And so you would need to know the strengths of your products. So HCl is our acid. You know, it's the acid. It starts with H. Cl is a halogen, and that halogen is not F. And so you know that this is a strong acid, okay? And then for our base, NaOH, Na is in the first column, and so that means it is a strong base. If you have both strong, acid and base, both strong, or both weak, so weak acid, weak base, then you have a neutral solution. So overall, this reaction would be neutral, okay? Which I know I wrote on the other side, but I'm writing it again. Okay, now, Acidic, same reaction, you still are having double replacement. So in this case, the CA, or excuse me, CU is going to switch with the H. So I get HCl again, and now I have CU with OH2. So we've just said that HCl is strong. Cl is a halogen that isn't F, so I have a strong acid. And then my base, copper is the metal in this case and copper is transition which means it is a weak base so now i have a weak excuse me a strong acid and a weak base so i have an acidic solution overall so the acid basically overpowers the base okay and our last one um calcium carbonate and water react so the CA and the H trade places, so I have H2CO3, carbonic acid, and calcium hydroxide. H2CO3, so if I do my little subtraction, three 
three, sorry, oh, goodness, three minus two equals one. So that is a weak acid. And then calcium hydroxide, calcium is in the second column. And remember if it's in the first or second column, it is a strong base. So the base overpowers the acid in this case, strong base over weak acid. And so I would end up with a basic solution overall. All right. Okay, so now the opposite of that essentially. So now what happens if I add um, an acid and a base? In this case, they will produce a salt and a water, two neutral compounds. And so same exact thing. You have double replacement. So you would have H and K in this case trading places. So you'd end up with HOH, which is plain old water. And then KCL is um, a metal plus a non-metal, an a cation and an anion, a left side and a right side of the periodic table. So this is a chemical salt. Same thing for the next one, the H and the CA flip. There's our water again. And then we get some calcium bromide, which is a chemical salt. All right, so pretty, um, pretty straightforward. If you can get hydrolysis, then you can get neutralization. Now, I know you were missing some math, so here you go. Neutralization reactions very often are used um, to determine how much of an acid or how much of a base is needed to neutralize the reactions. How, how, how can they cancel each other out? And there are some steps. So yay for steps. This should look very familiar to you after you read through them, particularly this part about the ratio of coefficients down here. That is because neutralization reactions are a type or are kind of like modified stoichiometry problems, which of course are everybody's favorite. So you're welcome. Stoichiometry problems. So you write a balanced equation. If you don't already have one, you figure out what you want and what you're given. Same old steps. Now here's where it's a little bit different. You're usually going to be converting to moles from molarity. Um, and a given volume. Sometimes you're going to convert from grams, but more often it's going to be from molarity. And then you take those um, moles that you convert to, and then you use a, um, a ratio of the coefficients. This is where you have to have the balanced equation. And then you calculate the molarity of what you want and what you're given. And then we'll, of course, do an example because I know you love them so much. Okay, so here we go. Hang on, I have it. I worked it out over here, so hopefully I can get it right. Um, you have a problem, and you have 11 milliliters of 0.748 molar NaOH. So basically, <clears throat> excuse me, that is your given. So this is what I know. I know I have this much, and then I know that I have. 10 milliliters of this H2C, HC2H3O2, but I don't know the concentration. And so this essentially is what I want. I'm trying to figure out this stuff about that acetic acid. Okay, so first of all, here's our balanced equation. So I have NaOH, and it's gonna react with HC2H3O2 to produce, so I've got a, a base plus an acid in this case. So the Na and the H switch places. So yay, here's my water. And then I'm gonna have some sodium acetate. So water and salt are left over. So two neutral compounds, they are neutralizing each other. And then I wanna balance this guy. And you're in luck, this is a super easy one to balance because everything has either a plus one or a minus one charge. And so every coefficient in this reaction is one. So that's gonna make our math a little easy and that's okay. All right, so here's our balanced equation. So now our next step 
is to, we've already figured out want and given, is to take that given and find moles. So remember our formula for molarity. Remember molarity is moles over liters. And I have two of those three um, variables. So I know that 0.748 molarity is equal to, now I don't have liters specifically, but I do have milliliters. So if I move my decimal three places, remember three places this way, I will get liters. So I would have 0 0.011. And then the thing that I don't know, but the thing that I want are the moles. So now to solve for x, and I'm going to round a little bit on this one, it's a pretty long decimal. So if you uh, multiply those two numbers to solve for x, you're going to get 0 0.0083. And that's where I'm stopping, but like I said, there's more, um, there are many more decimals there, but I'll round. And that's moles, and this is moles of NaOH. Okay, so now, next step, I take my coefficients and I'm going to do a little conversion. So I have moles, like I said, of NaOH. And I want to find moles of my given. So I'm trying to find moles of the HC2H3O2. And I already have this. Remember, they have to be catty corner from each other, so they'll cancel out. And kind of easy peasy because they're both one. So then I know, whew, I'm running out of space here. Sorry, I'm going to be really messy and draw this up here. So I will then, if I'm trying to find the concentration, which is molarity, to find the concentration of my um, acetic acid, I would take the 0 0.0083 moles. And I would divide it by the amount that I have. I would divide it by its volume, which is this 10 milliliters. Now I need that in liters, so I would move this three places again. So I would have point, oh, stop, point zero one. And so then if I did point zero zero eight three divided by point zero one, I would get, hang on, let me move that little arrow out of the way, I would get 0.83. And so that is the molarity, and that is my final answer. Sorry, I know those steps aren't super, super written out well, but um, so follow along with those steps. Balanced equation, figure out what you want and what you're given, convert to moles, Use the moles and the coefficients to get to the moles of what you want, and then find the concentration from there. Okay, so um, I'll of course give you some practice problems over these. Please, please, please ask if you have questions. Okay, last thing. This whole thing, neutralization reactions, are usually um, done in conjunction with a titration. And a titration is, um, a lab procedure where you basically have something that you know the concentration of, like the, the NaOH and the problem that we just did, and then you have something that you don't know the concentration of, and you're trying to figure, find your neutral point, and then do a neutralization problem. <clears throat> and so you will have to reach something that is called the end point. End points are usually um, achieved when you come to um, like a the in-between stage. And so usually people are used to, they probably have other things now, but most often a titration is done with an indicator that changes color. In this little picture that my head's almost covering up, in, um, in the beaker down there, you can see a really light pink liquid. That light pink is the in-between stage if you use phenolphthalein. Phenolphthalein stays clear in an acid and turns a very vivid dark pink in a base. And so if you get that light pink, it's right between clear and dark. And so 
this is done that little tube that is kind of up um, up here that is called a burette and it is like a fancy test tube basically with a little valve on the bottom and it measures how much solution you are putting into that beaker down below in the beaker down below this is where you have the thing that you um, that you don't know you know how much volume you have but you don't know its concentration so if you haven't already this um, this YouTube link that I have here it I couldn't find any like there were any um, any newer than like you know 2015 so they're a little bit old some of them are really old but um, I think this one was about 10 minutes he goes through a long, long process of how to kind of get it all set up. But if you go to about five minutes in, that's when you start seeing him actually do the titration. So I just, I kind of wanted you to see it. It's a pretty common um, lab procedure. So if you were to go to college and take like a general chem class, you most likely would do a titration. So I want you to see it at least. So anyway, hey, ask me questions if there's something that you need help on. Um, I will send you some problems tomorrow, so be kind of looking for that, and, um, and just let me know how you're doing. Bye, guys.